Well, thank you very much, Jim. Thank you to the organisers. And just... Uh, yeah, slight apology to anyone in, in, in here this morning. This, this may have the same conclusion. But if you weren't here, that's good. Uh, so, um, I just wanted to recap, really, on some projects that I've been involved with over the years and go right back kind of 30 years initially to CTRL. Uh, and some of those projects are around the early 2000s, including Framework, Crossrail, uh, and then have a look at what the current HS2 project is doing uh, around this theme. Uh, so, collaboration key to publication and synthesis, uh, as, as the, ho the whole um, session title has alluded to, uh, Channel Tunnel Rail Link was um, a particular large project. It was probably the, the first large project, certainly, that I'm aware of, that, that really started out with a focus on synthesis as the output given that it was a huge project corridor, comparatively, uh, and that we were, you know, at the dawn of, of real digital data. So the, 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 the key collaborators there, the Kent County Council, Relink Engineering is the company that designed and undertook uh, the uh, project. UCL, very, very uh, close relationship from day one with UCL in terms of the academic link and utilizing several uh, UCL departments in assisting with research strategy and also outputs. Uh, English Heritage, as was, obviously, key partner. And then I've got OW there, that's the Oxford Wessex Joint Venture at the time, who were responsible for uh, the analysis and publication end, but of course there were many other contractors, and apologies to those for not uh, labelling them, many other contractors involved in delivering the work. So, key published output for that project was on track, Archaeology of High Speed 1. I'm sure you've all read it. As I said, a key component to the strategy was a research strategy. So, that uh, from day one, sought to move away from the site-by-site -site treatment and see what could be gained from the synthesis of a corridor, linear corridor, um, of, of not great width, 100, 140 metres perhaps, but over, over 70 miles, 70 odd miles through Kent. This is uh, section one of the project. Uh, so the landscape approach to the investigation and the type of landscape questions were at the heart of the, this strategy. So when it came to CTRL analysis and publication, the project was, as I said, already focused on an association with the academics, yeah? And in terms of really uh, coming in to oversee particular period studies, uh, we had four, we labelled at least four, three were used, one not used in the end. Uh, four kind of leading academic experts in the professional period field to work with the o, uh, OW team to, to really see what the most we can get out of this project in terms of its regional synthesis uh, could be. Uh, so that UPD available on the ADS archive. Uh, I don't think this is going to be readable, but essentially just outlining the organisation of all those different parties together and how those le led to the final publication and outputs. So, again, the colours aren't great on this slide, but sent essential as well was this concept of a digital archive. And that, again, was one of the first large projects um, that... ADS in its kind of early years took on and say, right, what can we do with a project like this in terms of digital archiving, the core components of the fieldwork results? So that central box where all those red arrows are applying is pointing to digital uh, archive, if you can't read it. So absolute essential from the beginning that the project um, had as its key output making all this new data available 
in, in a format that can be reused, can be replicated, and can contribute to further synthesis, quite apart from the internal synthesis of the project itself. So, to drive that, uh, this work done by Robin Boast in 1996, the definition of a data standard for the project, uh, a data schema, yeah? Again, one of the very early attempts on infrastructure projects anyway to say, right, we've, we've got to standardize what we're doing here if we're going to make sense of this in synthesis, yeah? This new fieldwork data. So that, um, devised by Robin, uh, set out a series of data tables and GIS components. That meant the entire results could be written and put into a format that was computer readable from day one. Yeah, I think this is really important as well. We discussed this morning how even after 30 years of digital archiving, there's still a gap in many project archives regarding that machine readable data being made available. Uh, so this was the vision of this project from, from the get go and this is almost 30 years old. Very useful as well. The, the intention was for the internal management and decision making to have that data available in a digital format so you can quickly compare and contrast results from different parts of the scheme. Uh, ADS, again, hugely important role in developing a project archive for this project. And I just wanted to uh, flick through the contents. Yes, we've got reports, but of course, the most important is the machine readable data there for database, for spreadsheets, for the GIS component, uh, and I flicked on very quickly there, sorry. <laughs> We've left CTRL now. Another example, around the same time this was being developed, when the ADS was looking for, you know, big projects to demonstrate its capabilities, uh, was framework and uh, BAA work at Heathrow and Stansted. And again, this, these two projects exemplify, I think, uh, the quality of digital information that can be provided, yeah? And that greatly insist in synthesis work. <laughs> not, not personally involved in that one, but I just wanted to flag it up. It's still a great example, and it's still one of the best digital excavation archives that's been placed in the ADS. And, you know, this is going back 15 years. Apologies to Highways England, because there are others. Uh, so, Crossrail, um, again, was a collaborative effort in terms of involving uh, Historic England, uh, GLASS, the, the, the London Archaeological Service, uh, the City of London, uh, and the main contractors working on the project. So, again, that excavation strategy had very much uh, attempted to understand early on what the potential for synthesis was going to be and how the particular products um, can, can be planned at the fieldwork stage uh, as the key outputs. So local synthesis in this case, it's all within Greater London. Um, but there were four or five key, key themes identified in the research strategy uh, that we hoped, given sufficient data collection, we can contribute a synthetic study as part of the publication output. Again, probably too small to read. Nonetheless, we can look at them here. So the output uh, of Crossrail was 10 publications, six of which were very site-specific on, on deep urban strat. But these four, we thought, were ideal examples to bring to a more synthetic uh, study, uh, you've got four titles here, so one of them drew all the built heritage uh, recording work into a, into a statement on London's architecture, 
Uh, another one looks at all the interfaces we had with historic and heritage rail and elements of those networks and operations. Uh, another one looks at the Thames itself because we crossed the Thames several times uh, in terms of its paleoenvironmental history and settlement. And then another one was aimed at a particular zone of the city, the, the development of the West End uh, part of the city. So again, a really good opportunity there to, for a major project with, it, with the scope of a major project to bring synthesis right into the, into the project. But also, of course, leave that data behind to contribute to other synthesis. Really, really important outcome. Uh, and again, the ADS archive was the vehicle for all the data. And here, including uh, the reports and images, the CAD, all native format spreadsheets, GIS matrices, very important to Keith May, this one. And again, as he pointed out this morning, such a rarity to, to actually find uh, matrices in the, in the archive itself. And CT and X-ray data as well included now, as we move through time, there's more and more components to the digital archive, uh, as you all know. So just looking at HS2, which is the latest project that's dealt with the, the topic of synthesis as a future outcome and therefore developed a heritage uh, data schema to allow the management of that data. So similar to what we just looked at for CTRL, um, High Speed 2 internally has developed its own uh, heritage data schema. It's quite uh, widespread in terms of its coverage, salvage of historic assets, buildings, historic streetscapes, and archaeology. Um, so it's a comprehensive approach. It's, it's not perfect for everyone, uh, and it doesn't tick all the boxes. I don't think anything possibly can, uh, unless we agree a minimum data standard amongst us to apply to new field work. Uh, that was the topic I was talking about this morning. But nonetheless, the, the HS2, is, again, is a great tool put in place early on to allow that data to be used in synthesis. Um, as Chris just pointed out, you know, the availability of machine readable data is what makes synthesis easier. Um, and this is what we've really got to focus, I believe, on, and certainly ensure that these major public projects, you know, demonstrate that capability. Uh, so, there's just a, a, a an outline of the spatial data that goes with the HS2 schema. So that features, objects, areas are all included and it's comprehensive. Okay, so I'm just gonna run through this really quickly. We don't need to consider this line by line by any means, but the whole uh, vocabulary and validation of data in the heritage schema for HS2 is backed up by FISH wherever feasible and backed up by its own lookup tables where the, where the obvious list doesn't exist uh, and so on, so on. This is all the document management. So, I mean, the key, the key thing about HS2 is this, the, the post excavation is still to come. So there's a big opportunity when that does start to understand how wide reaching that can go in terms of bringing the outside areas into the scheme. So we're getting the most out of what is a linear corridor and not misunderstanding, again, as Chris pointed out, not misunderstanding the impact of that linear corridor by being able to access uh, the nearby context from other projects. And that means finding data uh, for that. Uh, so just to conclude, um, these major projects have been a really good vehicle uh, for demonstrating what's possible in terms of synthesis and, and data availability. Um, I don't think necessarily they've had the kind of impact if we look back at the time since CTRL. It hasn't yet become normal to present each project like that, and I think that's a bit of a missed opportunity, but hey-ho, we are where we are, and we're discussing here at the conference today how to address these kind of gaps. Yeah. 
Um, so, the fully reproducible archives is the goal. Um, we need to work quite hard to get that to become normal. Uh, and again, we discussed some of those issues this morning on how that might happen in the session in here this morning. Um, I personally think we do need a mandatory baseline for content. You know, even if a standardized schema is too far fetched for our, us as a profession here in this country, um, other countries have tried it. Yeah. It is fraught with difficulty. And of course, there's the camp who really uh, resist standardization in the sense that possibly it stifles innovation. Uh, I personally think that we can look at some kind of minimum mandatory baseline for the content of archives and some, something along those lines we can probably all sign up to. I think that is my last slide. Oh no, just a quick note and apologies to Jeffrey. I grabbed this off the screen the other day at one of his talks and I just wanted to uh, just really kind of point out that the USA, this example is from the USA, has been following a really similar strategy in TDAR playing the ADS role and the accumulation of lots of digital archives. Oh, what do we do with all this stuff? Uh, and the outcome uh, there, which I wasn't aware of uh, until I, I saw this talk, the Coalition for Archaeological Synthesis has been established back in 2017, I think it was. And that has now, uh, if I just, yeah, established in the, in the US is now also got a branch in Kiel, and it's an international effort, although US-based, to bring together synthesis research in archaeology uh, under some umbrella of funding. So I just thought it'd be just useful to show this in terms of our discussion about uh, how synthesis can be achieved. This is certainly one angle uh, that is probably worth uh, looking into since it is international. And I'll leave it there. Thank you.